Greetings from Dharamsala and welcome to our roundtable discussion on the unity of peace, justice, and inclusion. We're gathered here in Dharamsala in the studios of Radio Free Asia. Uh, so my thanks to RFA for their collaboration on this program, with special thanks to Libby Liu and Calden Lodo. I'd also like to thank GHR Foundation for their invaluable support for our program. And we're here in Dharamsala with 26 youth leaders from 12 different countries affected by violent conflict. All of them have made commitments in despite conflict, hatred, and violence to be peace builders in their communities. And at a time when we are facing global crises with record levels of displacement, uh, civil wars, and violent extremism, it is more important than ever to engage the young people who hold the key to building a more peaceful future. We're gathered here for a week of leadership training as a part of the USIP Generation Change Fellowship. And the centerpiece of this program is a two-day dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We've had two days of dialogue where the youth leaders have shared their stories, their challenges, and they've heard from His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, inspiration, and they've taken great courage and hope. Um, we thank uh, His Holiness for the four years of partnership, and we look forward to a very thoughtful and lively conversation as our panelists reflect both on the week as well as the challenges to building peace, justice, and inclusion. And with that, I'd like to introduce Vice President David Young from U.S. Institute of Peace, who will moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Hello to our in-house audience, and hello to our online audience. In the house tonight here in the RFA studio, here in Dharamsala, we have our two dozen fellows, our Generation Change fellows from conflict-affected countries around the world. Along with them are four expert Generation Change trainers who have themselves gone through the Generation Change program. And we also have four thought leaders, well-known international experts in peace building, who've joined us for this week in Dharamsala. And then along with Nancy, several of our other USIP colleagues who have helped put on this program. So I give you a warm welcome from beautiful Dharamsala. The unity of peace, justice, and inclusion. I was inspired today by our second of two days with His Holiness the Dalai Lama to provide sort of a Buddhist interpretation of our topic. What I mean is the unity of peace, justice, and inclusion is these three beautiful concepts go together in our, in our peace building efforts. We'll also be talking about how this unity is expressed in the UN Sustainable Development Goal 16 and how we can use so-called SDG 16 to advance our peace building work around the world. To explore this topic, we're very fortunate and very honored to have four amazing peace builders. Before I introduce them, I'd like to give you a brief background to our topic tonight. 19 years ago, at the UN in New York City, September 2000, world leaders gathered at the dawn of a new millennium, and they declared and pledged to spare no effort to pursue human security, human <coughs> rights, and human development. Indeed, those were the three founding pillars of the United Nations. Shortly after that historic summit, they, the UN created this Millennium Development Goals. They were eight goals to be pursued over 15 years. They defined the new international development agenda for the new millennium. They were extremely innovative, but from our peace building community's perspective, they lacked three important ingredients, peace, justice, and inclusion. So for peace builders and human rights activists alike, for the next 15 years, we advocated to f address this gap. So at, in 2015, at the Millennium Summit th at the United Nations, the world leaders created the new 2030 Agenda, 17 goals now replacing the 18 Millennium Development Goals. In particular, SDG 16, we believe, is a historic opportunity to make peace, human rights, democratic governance, and the rule of law integral parts of human development. They're especially important for fragile and conflict-affected states where the social compact is broken down. And SDG 16 provides a catalyst for a new social compact. 
Last month in New York, world leaders gathered for the first quadrennial review of the SDGs overall, and SDG 16 in particular. So it's a good time for all of us in the peace building community to take stock of SDG 16. In New York, everyone agreed that progress on SDG 16 has been uneven. Civic space continues to shrink around the world. Our peace tables, there are still too few seats for youth and for women. Violent conflicts indeed abide. And the overall journey from fragility to resilience for many countries is yet stymied. Therefore, we believe youth must be a key part of peace discussions. And so we're going to discuss today how to make SDG 16 a reality for countries and local communities. And we were inspired by our dialogues this week with His Holiness the Dalai, Dalai Lama, where he told us that youth are the seeds of future peace. So let me introduce our wonderful panelists. To my left is uh, Rawan Khafala. She's a peace builder from Libya. Her organization is Together We Build. They support the twin agendas of women, peace, and security, and youth, peace, and security. Welcome, Rawan. Thank you. To her left is Victor Ochin. He's one of our thought leaders this week. He's an internationally recognized peace builder from Uganda. He's the founder and director of the African Youth Initiative Network, which provides crucial support for war victims, transitional justice, and youth leadership. Welcome, Victor. It's a pleasure. Thanks. To my immediate right is Dalia Fernanda Marquez Añez. She's a peace builder from Venezuela. She's the founder and secretary general of United Youth in Action. Her organization builds bridges of peace on gender equity, on the environment, and on youth leadership. And to my far right is Steve Kilalea. He's equally renowned as a peace builder from Australia. He's the founder and executive chairperson of the Institute for Economics and Peace. The Institute's Global Peace Index is one of the world's leading measures of national and global peacefulness. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for joining us. Thanks. Good to be here. <laughs> so we're going to start off the discussion by rooting, rooting our discussion in our Dharm, Dharamsala experience, our beautiful experience this week. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists, why were you motivated to participate in USIP's Generation Change Exchange here in Dharamsala? And could you tell us briefly about your experience this week with the fe your, your fellows, your thought leaders, and of course, our dialogues with His Holiness? So, Dali, please start. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with everyone my experience. So, I was motivated to participate in this program because I have a real commitment with myself to learn more and more each time. At the same time, to be a better young leader and being better peace builder. So at the same time, being here with so many young people living in different countries in conflict as I, it seems like a real good opportunity to learn from the experience and at the same time share my own experience and teach us between us how can we deal with the conflict and how can we act against all the violence and how being better and keep being a peace builder in our countries. Thank you, Dalia. Yep. Rowan, please. Um, well, thank you, uh, David, for, for having me uh, on this panel. Um, well, the Generation uh, Change Program uh, has a lot of components that compels you uh, to participate. Um, but first, ma well, mainly, it works on the self-development and the self-awareness of, of uh, the young leaders from, from these countries. Um, they believe that self-development is the essence before taking any step to uh, develop your, your community and mitigate or solve the issues that are going on. Um, it also provides uh, the opportunity to have a dialogue or a conversation with one of the, uh, one of the most recognized leaders out there, which is His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama. Um, and I personally, uh, from the past two days, I've, I've gained so much knowledge uh, that no one can comprehend uh, in a few words. Um, 
but also uh, when you see uh, the word Dara Masala also in the program, it's, it has a very good vibe, a good energy that, that also compels you to, to participate and really experience the culture and what surrounds it. Yeah, and then that's for me what's uh, the main reasons uh, why I like to participate. Thank you. Victor, thank you for your leadership. What brings you to Dharamsala this week? Oh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to be in Dharamsala. I think uh, I come from Africa, which uh, in many instances is a continent that has been through the longest series and layers of violent conflict around the world. In many ways, uh, Africa is a continent that is calling if there is any continent that is so much in need of peace and justice and inclusion, it's Africa. So coming in, getting to meet fantastic young people doing massive work you know, on peace building in different parts of the world gives so much rejuvenation. But also my colleagues, my fellow thought leaders, uh, these are people who are tremendously engaged in doing great stuff around the, around the continent. And I, in so many ways, I, I carried with me the passion, the feeling, the commitment that my drive from the, from the continent is what I'm coming forward, not to showcase how badly Africa is affected, but I'm coming to this platform as a proof of what is possible mm -hmm. in the continent. Of course, meeting with this holiness, you know, Dalai Lama is compared to nothing. And I, you know, I, you know, everything I wanted in life was always to have opportunity to meet him hearing his personal experience in vocation, such, you know, rejuvenation to be in this community alone, you feel holy. So I'm, I'm, up, I'm up here again. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, you're a busy person. You're a busy <laughs> peace builder, busy entrepreneur, uh, busy philanthropist. Why'd you take out a week to join us? Well, look, to be honest, David, I just jumped at the opportunity. Having met the Dalai Lama on another occasion, I just always marvel at his wisdom. But also for me, when I look at peace, because that's what we study, most of the time when people are talking peace, they're not actually talking peace, they're talking violence. They're then looking at how to stop violence even when they think they're talking peace. Mm -hmm. But if we're looking at peace, particularly personal peace, that's something really quite different. And so dialogues with the Dalai Lama, what you get at is the essence of personal peace. And I think for all the change makers and peace builders here, you can only go so far out as you can go in because you always hit incredibly tough situations. And that internal resilience is what causes you to bounce back and keep going. And the Dalai Lama, I think, is the best example on the planet of that. Thank you, Steve. And thanks to all of you for sharing your thoughts about our week in Dharamsala. So let's turn our thoughts to Sustainable Development Goal 16, and in particular to this UN slash Buddhist idea of a, a unity between peace, justice, and inclusion. So Goal 16 represents this, this trio of values, and it embodies them all within one goal. So I'd like to ask all of you, in what sense uh, is the idea of this unity relevant to your work? And how is, does your work reflect this unity? Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with Rwanda this time? Yes. Um, well, I work with a, a national organization uh, called Together We Build It. Um, and the core message uh, or the core objective of this organization lies within the SDG number 16. Um, Together We Build It was originally founded um, to establish, uh, a, 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 to, to, to support the transitional uh, process after the Libyan revolution in 2011. And by supporting that process or the peaceful transitional uh, uh, phase, it's by empowering young uh, people and women. Um, and, and together we build that, uh, does that under the framework of 1325 uh, resolution and 2250 resolutions. Um, and we work a lot on advocacy, uh, we work a lot on awareness and consultations. But really what we're trying to do is to keep all the core uh, messages of our work, uh, also the approaches of our work, on a lot of levels. So uh, we believe that the target group is also very important. So what we do is uh, when we have our, uh, when we advocate for women inclusion in the peace process, um, when we advocate to include uh, you to be on the table of the decision making, um, 
we do not only talk uh, to the national government, we talk to the community, to the national government and the international community. Um, as you may know, um, after 2014, um, a civil war broke after the revolution in Libya. And the international community became the main mediators for the peace process in Libya. Um, and this is when we've also noticed women were even more systematically excluded from this process. So what we try to establish is to try to include them in and um, have their, their presence on the table as well. Because uh, when, when, when we thought about the idea or like the perfect idea of a social contract after the revolution and when the whole sense of, of freedom overcame us all, you think of a social contract as, as a, a living document that includes all the people of the society. And when we speak about the entire society, we're speaking about the women, we're speaking about the youth, we're speaking about the minorities, we're, spe we're speaking about everyone being on the same t table at the same level, having uh, their chance to participate with their ideas and make decisions also for themselves. And this is what we're trying to, to establish uh, with Together We Build It organization. Um, and I think this really lies um, in, in when, when you say uh, peace, uh, justice, and inclusion. Because, because really, can you achieve peace if you do not include all the members of the community? Mm -hmm. Where is the justice when young people and women pay a tremendous uh, amount of, of losses when, in the revolutions and in wars and conflicts, while when it comes to the formal peace processes, uh, they're not even mentioned? And, and what is inclusion if if, if, I mean, if you leave inclusion out of the equation, then you really cannot establish the two first words. So I think this is a very important triangle that um, I think everyone should be having in, in their main uh, visions of, of how to improve their own community. Thank you, Rowan, and thank you for your important work. Dahlia, tell us about how this triangle works within your organization's efforts in Venezuela. Well. Before I answer this question, I want to go back to the first question mm -hmm. about my experience with the other fellows Please. and the talk leaders. I have to say that all of them are great people. Each one has a different history, but all the histories are so inspiring histories. Mm. So I feel honored to be in here and have the opportunity to share my experience and to learn from them. And about my experience with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, I have to say that this is the most important day of my life at this moment and the most transcendental day. That's it. Uh, now, about the question, peace, justice, and inclusion as, as unity and my work with these different topics. Well, we cannot say that we have peace without justice. And at the same time, we cannot say that we have justice without inclusion, because we need to include all the different peoples, especially the most vulnerable people, in a good justice. Therefore, we need a stronger institution, and that is the we do in my NGO. We give free advice to the most vulnerable people to gain justice, and at the same time, we try to give train to the future young leaders who will be in the future politics in the country to try to guarantee good institutions at the future. So if we have inclusion, we maybe can talk about justice. And if we have a good justice system in our countries where the people respect the rules, when the justice can, when anyone can get justice, so we can talk about peace, because peace is like equal rights for everyone and the respect of the human rights of everyone in the country, no matter if you live in, the, in this community or if you have this religion or if you have this political idea. So therefore we want to trying to have a stronger institution and give the opportunity to get justice to the people of the most vulnerable areas. Thank you very much. Victor, you yes. started one of the most important peace building organizations in Africa. Mm -hmm. So please reflect with us about 
this unity of ideas and how, how they relate to your work? Yeah. Again, uh, I am directing an organization called African Youth Initiative Network, which is an indigenous African initiative started 15 years ago in 2005. And we are happy that along the years we have seen so much, we have learned so much, and we know what works, especially when it comes to inclusion of the key players in peace building. And uh, the whole intention, our agenda was how can we raise a generation of leaders, a young generation of leaders, with a willingness to engage in politics that will make peace possible. So the whole thing is, how do we mobilize young people who have been through history of conflict? You know, myself, I grew up in war, I grew up in the camp, and the whole motivation of getting started was, we are sick and tired of our own suffering as a result of conflict. And then we said, let's form ourselves a platform where we can come together, turn around our, the page of pain, and let our pain become a reason for us you know, to come forward. The whole concept of us getting started was, it started out of anger, but it turned out to be a motivation to ourselves and to other people as well. So all these years, 15 years down the road, our focus has had been about restoring dignity of people who have been through war, those who have been violently abused, mutilated, gunshot, those who have been sexually raped and all these kind of people. And to date, I must say, 15 years down the road, we have treated, provided reconstructive surgical mm -hmm. rehabilitation to over 22,000 people in, in northern Uganda. But that has also given us opportunity to help explore what does peace mean to the victims. That's why the essence of peace, justice, and inclusion led us to ask the question, who's peace, who's justice, who to be included? So when SDG came in, we were moving away from when MDG came in 2000, year 2000, it came and found us in war. So MDG bypassed us. Mm. So when SDG came in 2015, I was actually requested by the Office of the Secretary General of the UN to be one of the 15 ambassadors mm. to raise the flag as we are launching the Sustainable Development Goal. Mm. And I was given goal number 16. Mm. So SDG goal 16 actually was launched in Africa. There were two goals launched in Africa, SDG goal 16 and goal 8 in mm. South Africa. So I did raise the flag for goal 16. Mm two days before the launch in New York. Mm. So that gave us opportunity, but what guided our intervention the most has been precisely, if you talk about peace, justice, and inclusion, we're looking at how can we create an inclusive society that is peaceful and just? Mm -hmm. So that's how we twist it around. Instead of saying peace, justice, and inclusion, the whole motivation is let us use our opportunity, our network, to create an inclusive and peaceful society that is just. So. Since then, it has been a reason for us to mobilize the young people in the continent. What I can say, it's very difficult for something good to come out of life of conflict. Mm -hmm. But only when you help people define what peace means like, what justice means like, then it gives you a reason to know that I'm working for who's justice. Together we can achieve, but if we keep the definition way higher up within the diplomatic level, it becomes diplomatic and problematic. Mm -hmm. But we want to bring it to the grassroots where it's all about people. SDG was never about the better system. It was about how can we have an inclusive process that every person is a player in achieving Agenda 2030. Mm -hmm. So this is how we have been driving, and it has been a good reason for us to mobilize young people, those who are affected by conflict, rural, urban, young, old, black, white, and we are doing this across the continent now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Victor. It's a pleasure. Steve, your institute in Sydney is doing some of the most cutting edge research on peace building in the world. So tell us, in, how does uh, this unity of peace, justice and inclusion influence, if at all, your research? Well, as you know, David, a lot of the goals within SDG 16 were sort of based around the work which came out of the Institute for Economics mm -hmm. and Peace. But I think we need to look more broadly and look at all the SDG, go, uh, SDG uh, targets and goals. So there's 169 targets all up within the SDGs. And if we look, that's far too many goals for any one government to be able to focus on. So there's a need to prioritise where do we go. So now, if we look at it and we look at the research which comes out of the Institute for Economics and Peace, there are certain things which really drive the processes, which create for better societies. And so one of those is corruption. 
-hmm. And out of the 169 goals, or tar sorry, out of the 169 targets, there's only one on corruption. Do you know which goal that's in? SDG 16. Mm -hmm. But we look at peace. Why do we want peace? Why do we want inclusion? Why do we want justice? What we want is a society where human beings can flourish, where they can meet their full potential. So the research we've done around peace, it's what we find is those same qualities which create for a highly peaceful society or positive peace, create an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. So, you're high in these qualities of peace, then you'll have higher economic growth, you'll have higher measures of well-being, better performance on measures of ecology, and much, much more. So that brings us back now to SDG 16. And SDG 16 is the pivotal goal. Even development, we found the research, as peace falls off, development targets fall off as well. And if we look into the countries which are beleaguered by conflict, what we find with the Millennium Development Goals, none of them made any of the targets which were defined. Therefore, peace is at the heart of the SDGs. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for making that very important point. You know, those of us in the SDG 16 community, we're very proud to get on the 2030 agenda. At the same time, in a humble way, we believe, as Steve said, that our goal, in our humble opinion, is the foundation for all of the sustainable development goals, and indeed, the foundation for all human development. So that's uh, why we are celebrating our community here this week in Dharamsala. Before we get too deep into our technical discussion about Sustainable Development Goal 16, I wanted to open up the floor to our wonderful participants in our Generation Change Fellows Exchange here in Dalm Solo this week. As Nancy said, they are 25 or 26 individuals uh, across 12 countries that are experiencing conflict, and they're all doing cutting edge peace building work. So I want to give you, uh, you fellows, an opportunity to reflect on what's been said so far in our discussion. So please raise your hand, identify yourself, and uh, make a comment or uh, pose a question for our panelists. Yes, Salmia. Hi. Uh, so my question is that we are talking about inclusion. We are talking about role of young people in achieving SDG 16 by 2030. But um, it would be great to hear from the panelists what they think about uh, the uh, donor donors, how inclusive are their uh, uh, strategies are, and how inclusive their guidelines are, especially for the youth-led uh, peace building organization, and also the shrinking spaces for civil society organization at international platforms. Thank you. That's Salmi from India. Why don't we take another question or comment and then we'll collect a few. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, all the panelists. Hey, do you want to identify yourself for our audience? Yes, I'm Hain from Myanmar. Um, I'm also working in the positive peace and youth inclusion in decision-making process and hence contributing towards peace. And that's, I think, the one of the also, also one of the main challenges I faced is still, although we are trying so hard, there's always some kind of dis discrimination towards young people yeah. at many levels, in decision-making level, in the parliament, inclusion, politics, or even like as Somya said before, like the, you know, grant uh, kind of like. Uh, donations and things like that as well. So my question to you is, uh, what kind of suggestions can you provide us, or what kind of encouragement can you give us to face these all kind of uh, s s challenges we are facing as a, as youth peace builders in our in our countries? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hayne. We'll take one more comment or question. I see Lorena's hand in the front row. Lorena, you want to identify yourself? Yes, so hello to everyone. My name is Lorena Gomez. I come from Bogota, Colombia. And 
mm, my words are more common. Um, some days, some months ago, I was talking to a friend, and uh, we were thinking about peace, and I really relate to what Victor said, because peace is normally thought or represented white. And we were saying, you know what? Peace may be multicolor. So I would like to hear what you all think about that, because probably it's more about diversity, really. Mm. In, in my case in Colombia, I could say that peace doesn't really let uh, let the way that we are representing peace, excuse me, doesn't repre doesn't inspire our imagination on how can our daily la daily interactions look like. Um, so I think that leads to a very superficial, and again I connect with Victor, superficial level on how we are talking about peace building. Mm -hmm. So it's very institutional, yeah. an institutional narrative, mm -hmm. instead of being uh, something that goes more at the grassroots level. Thank you for those excellent comments. So why don't we unpack them a little bit? I'd like to get the impressions of our two youth leaders on the panel. If you can speak to the points made about perceived discrimination towards youth peace building organizations and perhaps um, feeling also less attention from donors to youth peace building organizations. So from your perspective, do you have that similar experience. So why don't we start with Rowan? Yes. Um, it's a very good question because um, I was actually conducting a research um, as Together We Build It last year uh, and with the UNOI organization. And the research was basically um, measuring uh, what are the challenges and the enablers of young peace builders movement um, in the countries of, I think, uh, Libya, Colombia, Afghanistan, and Sierra Leone. Um, and one of the main challenge that kept popping up in every interview I conducted was like, we do not have money to mm -hmm. do anything. Mm -hmm. Donors do not trust us. Uh, the national governments obviously do not give money to, to, to small projects. Well, not in an extreme extent anyways. The international communities also does not provide money. So they were speaking that there are certain limitations to what they can do to improve the community. Um, also, um, there are like uh, just lately a couple of uh, cleaning up campaigns that are happening in Tripoli because uh, we have a, a lot of environmental issues going on uh, and a lot of trash is piling up in the Tripoli streets. Um, and a lot of the people who started the cleaning campaigns do not have fundings and they paid from their own money. And I think, like in Libya's case, uh, going deeper into the analysis of the research because uh, when we spoke about it, they claim that these young peace builders lack experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the Libyan civil society is still not mature enough. You're speaking at a civil society that was established after 2011, You're speaking at a society that only knew freedom and peace and human rights after 2011. So, I mean, obviously, young you were or old, you wouldn't be experienced enough, honestly. <laughs> so it's, it's not uh, exactly an age related. And we're trying, and we're trying to actually do something. And a lot of uh, INGOs are, are, are investing a lot, and they're trying to provide a lot of programs. But still, um, it's quite difficult, and it's quite challenging uh, for young Libyans uh, to get funds. This is, this is for certain. This is guaranteed. Uh, but still, the good thing, uh, well, at least about the young peace builders I know in Libya, uh, this, that doesn't stop them. Like I said, only like uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, like uh, young people paid from their own money to do a cleanup. They paid from their own money to throw an art exhibit. They, throw, they pay from their own money to do a, a workshop or, or like uh, a debate or something like that. So it's it's also about the the don't let limitations get into you because if it's only a matter of money it can be resolved i mean like a lot of young people who were proven themselves and they done a, and conducted a lot of uh, active work uh, in the civil society they were able to to gain the trust uh, at least from the international community and UN entities to get uh, funds and, and donations thank you Dolly, what's been your your experience? There are many needs in Venezuela in the 
cri well, crisis? Uh, I will start saying that since my NGO exists, it is six years ago, we never have been working with financial support from any institution. And even with the lack of money, we're still working. How? How can we work as young leaders without money? Well, it's easy. There are many other NGOs working, like your NGOs, trying to find other NGOs to work together. So please don't see money, the lack of money, as a problem. See it as a challenge and keep working. We have been developing several projects. At the same time, you can try to find support by the universities. By example, it's a good idea for us. It works. At the same time, from other NGOs. That's it. It's possible. We do it. Because in our country, NGOs are under persecution. So it's impossible to get financial support. Thank you. So Victor, even though you're still very young, you're <laughs> one of the elders on our panel. So I'll ask both you and Steve. I'm a former youth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as the former youth, current elder, <laughs> you, both, you and Steve have both been around the block many times in terms of yeah. working with donors, uh, whether they be bilateral government agencies or multilateral agencies like the yeah. UN or the World Bank or private foundations. Mm -hmm. What's your experience? Do they... Even though they sign on rhetorically to SDG 16 and other SDGs, mm -hmm. do they truly take an inclus inclusive approach? Do they truly take a diverse approach in the way that Lorena asks? So first, Victor, and then Steve. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. And I appreciate the question that Lorena asked about uh, the need to, to stretch the thinking beyond the boardrooms, beyond the, you know, the spaces, beyond dialogue, beyond statistics. We, we do need to understand that when you talk about trust, trust is very limited towards the global south. You're in Africa, you're in South America, you're in Asia, there's limited trust. And it's worst, it's double tragedy if a youth, if a young person. Unless we know our friends in, our, in the US and in, in Europe, they do get some support. Although they are young, they do get some support because they have a system, they are, you know, economic industries do support them. But when it comes to the global south, trust is zero. So, in a way, I, I would think like, there's, yes, a very good, loud commitment by international communities, the donors, and even the UN must be taking responsibility that how can we translate and trans, you know, transform the, the, the rhetoric into action? Because if we know young people are the key players in current conflicts, then we, we don't support them. There's so much money for war, and there's no money for peace building. Mm -hmm. And then we are saying, when are we going to help United Nations, you know, our countries, all these big shots, to realize that as long as we don't pay attention to the legitimate owners of the future, SDG say it is their dream, but we need to pay attention to the young people who are the legitimate owners of the future because we can't talk about 2030, 2040, without having people who are going to be there active in 2030, 2040, taking lead in thinking and engagement. So in terms of financing, that's a, agreed as a general outcry of lack of support to the youth initiative. But also in terms of, we do think there is a very strong contrast between theoretical success and practical success. My two sisters talked about how hard they find it to get money in the community. I started working 15 years ago. Most NGOs, especially the youth-led initiative, do not see their fifth anniversary. They start well as good dreams, good thinkers, and all that, but along the way, challenges come, you know. You need money to facilitate the process, but if there's no resources, you can't. There's so much money for war, but there's no money for peace building. And we are saying, can we refrain, we move away from this post-mortem mindset of peace, where we only want to come when there's war. We only want, to, we are ready to respond to the next humanitarian crisis but we are not ready to prevent. The world has got the capacity. And I'm happy that we are talking with a U.S. government support, you know, in a U.S. government supported platform. America is a big player in the global peace and security. How do we get ready so much to respond to the next humanitarian crisis? 
we know what is going to happen soon, but you don't step in to prevent. So young people are saying, in our approach, we do think that the best way is to prevent conflict upfront by engaging in diplomacy. Let's engage dialogue among the young people who can speak among, you know, among the peers. But if you talk about the diplomacy and mediation, it's too way high up in the political radar, which young people doesn't get there. And yet, young people are the key players when it comes to they're the, they're the tools for fighting, the tools for war. And if we don't engage them in become tools for mediation and dialogue, I think that's where we're missing a point. Coming to the Ramsala makes a lot of difference that we are trying to nurture the thinking, the mindset that we move away from the post-mortem approach to peace to a pre-mortem, where we research and see that the next war might break here. What do we do up front? Mm. We know climate change is coming. Who are going to be affected? The young people. How are we going to manage and share the little we have if you don't have capacity to tolerate one another, to dialogue, to engage in diplomacy, to engage in inclusion? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are struggling on their own. There's money in the world, but there's no will. Everything is rhetoric on how mm -hmm. to support. We need to change that mindset if mm -hmm. we want to see success in the community. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. So, Steve, you're a current elder, but... Uh, <laughs> Young at heart. Former youth <laughs> former peace youth builder, <laughs> former adventurer, former surfer on the sands of uh, Australia's beautiful shores. So, and you have no conflict of interest. You're a philanthropist, so please give us your unvarnished views about the current so, donor landscape that mm, you see. So, I think the issue is money. So if we look at the cost of violence to the global economy, it's about $14 trillion a year. So to put that in perspective, that's about 11% of global GDP. If we took 1% of the cost of that, that's all the money which is spent on overseas developmental aid in one year. Just 1%. Just 1%. If we just looked at violent conflict and ignored other forms of violence, what we find, that's about $600 billion a year. Now, the amount of money spent on peacekeeping is literally 1% of that. And that peacekeeping comes after the effect, and peace building is even less. So this matter of priorities around what do we want to do and where do we, where do we want to spend our money. So if we look the overseas developmental aid in many of the countries in the West now it's shrinking. So it's becoming smaller. And so the question for the international community and those ones who are interested in this, how do you actually reverse it? But I know from my own experience, and we've been out of my family foundation, we've conducted about 200 projects around the world. And through the Institute for Economics and Peace, we've run all sorts of workshops in many, many places around the world on positive peace. And so we look at the developmental pie at the moment, women and youth get quite a substantial share. And you're right, it doesn't, not, doesn't go very far. We all feel poor. So the question's how do you actually change this? And this comes back to one of the questions is peace. How do you actually market and publicise peace? And I think that's one of the key things for the international community for peace. How can we actually do it better? So the work we've done is try and take indexes and use them as ways of being able to promote peace. And so let's say for the Global Peace Index, we launched that each year and we did it in June this year. So we had about 2 billion media impressions globally and 240 million social media impressions. And so that's one of the ways we do to actually publicise peace. But the thing with peace is it's a non-event most of the time because when there's peace, what is there to report on? Mm -hmm. Whereas the media likes to report on violence. Violence has something which is immediate. Peace is something which is sustainable over the long term. So the questions now really is how do you actually take peace and now find things which you can actually use as an event. Peace. When we sign, let's say, a, a, a contracts on peace, let's say like happened in Colombia, for example, a peace agreement, that's an example of an event. But we need to get much, much smarter on how to actually get peace into the news. Thank you, Steve. 
Yes, so a lot of hands up. I'm going to, though, I'm not going to call on those that have already, so I'm going to go first to Idris in the front row and Dami next to him. If, and then I'm going to go in the back and then um, we'll take stock of where we're at. But please, if I haven't called on you yet, keep your hands up. Oh, oh I'm sorry. So, Ari, could Thank you please you so identify yourself? Yeah. Thank you so much, David. My name is Ari Mawien from South Sudan. I am a Generation Change Fellow. And uh, <coughs> my question is to uh, David, uh, sorry, to Steve and uh, and uh, Victor. <coughs> Victor, when you mentioned the idea of preventive uh, diplomacy as one way of approaching uh, peace, I, I really connected with it. And uh, when David mentioned that, sorry, when uh, Steve mentioned that their research show that most of the countries that have violence are actually not developed. And he says, peace is the heart of it. I really understand that because I come from a country where youth are marginalized and youth have been used as a means of violence. And when you try to understand the reason behind that, it's because these youth, as you, as you know, uh, Victor, there is issue of poverty. Mm -hmm. There is issue of less mm -hmm. of education, you know, that is happening in their own countries. Mm -hmm. So the politicians see them very vulnerable and use them actually to fight one another. Yep. Yep. And I want to say that the few of us that I hear are the fine ones within our communities. They are the few that were privileged to be educated, and that's why we are here. And our organization, such as mine, for example, is looking at bringing peace through helping the youth, the few youth that we represent, we the few that come here. And how do we help them? It's through edu education, mm -hmm. you know, it's through provision of basic uh, uh, services to them. It is through employment. Mm -hmm. It is our organization that can help mm -hmm. we the youth that have come up and founded organizations that support the youth within the communities. But we get the challenge, you know, with support. You know, they have mentioned UN, USIP, and the other global peace, you know, organization. There is an issue to really redirect the energy towards how can we use youth better in order to bring peace to their own countries. So I would like to hear from uh, Steve what is the link between, you know, economy in terms of resources, mm -hmm. lack of employment, and actually using youth to bring peace within their countries? I'm sorry my question is long, but I felt <laughs> I had to take time to explain this. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. So I'm going to ask all of the panelists to store in their memory banks uh, <laughs> the reflections yeah, okay. of our young fellows, and because I want to give the voices uh, that came to Dharamsala yeah. as much opportunity as possible. So I have a list of Idris, Dami, Naomi, uh, Ferris, and Luis. I'm going to ask each of you to be very brief, and so I'll go in that order. And uh, I'm not going to call on those that have already spoken, unfortunately. So uh, Idris, please start. Uh, first of all, hello to the panelists, the fellows, and uh, uh, the audiences which are watching us from their television at their homes. Uh, my name is Edris from Afghanistan. I have a comment and a question. My question refers to Victor, and my comment is to Dalai. Uh, about comments, you know, I agree that we can do something with, uh, without money, without financial aid. But the point is here that we can do greater things with money, with financial aid. It has been happened many times that me and my team in our organization, we didn't have any money to pay for rent, to rent a car, to, to just have a travel to the villages to have training for them. Mm -hmm. This is the point that we have to consider. And uh, my question from Victor, 
15 years ago, you have established your own organization, and yeah. I'm sure that in that 15 years ago, you were really young. I really appreciate. I really, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I really can want to know that how did you start? How did you find financial? Yeah. And, yeah. and how did yeah. you start? And what, what was the point? I really, mm -hmm. I really appreciate to know that from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Idris. So, uh, Dami, then Naomi, and so everyone, please be brief. We're starting to get down to the end of the hour. Thank you. My name is um, Damilola Babatunde from Nigeria. I really love um, the issue that was raised about youth being excluded when it comes to dialogues, discussions that actually concerns us. When it comes to the suffering part, we all suffer it. But then when it comes to we finding solution, we're talking about uh, how we feel, about what we are passing through, we are not giving the opportunity. So and I believe that if uh, rather than just waiting on um, maybe there will be a day or a space for us at the high level for us to um, communicate our feelings. Mm -hmm. What are the practical steps that I can take, that they can take, that youth leaders around the world can take mm -hmm. to make sure that we, our voices are heard, to make sure that we can communicate what we feel, we can communicate our own ideas, mm -hmm. and we can contribute to um, discussions that actually shape what happens to us. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Naomi. Thank you very much. My name is Naomi Epoki. I'm from Nigeria. Um, well, when I was listening to Victor, a thought came into my mind when he was talking about um, some parts of the world that have more inclusion than some other parts when he said the global south, there are less opportunities for youth. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm directing this question to Steve. Um, because you do research on peace, what do you think about those places that run extractive political institutions? Because like, a lot of um, countries right now that are close to peaceful, I don't mean peaceful, peaceful, but close to peaceful, mm -hmm. run inclusive political and economic institutions. Mm -hmm. But most of the countries that suffer violence a lot currently run on very extractive political and economic institutions. So um, how do you mm -hmm. promote peace, justice, and inclusion in a system of government that is already fixed as an extractive political institution. Mm. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. So I'm going to take two more comments and then give the last words to our panelists. So I have Ferris and then Luis. <coughs> Hello, uh, this is Firas from Syria. And I want to ask uh, the respective panelists about proxy wars. So we are living or been observing uh, the proxy wars through the last 10 years or more. My question here is that since the, the, f main, the main funders are usually, we, we, are, we observe that the main funders are usually main actors as well. And this conflict of interest is really affecting the, uh, maybe let's say, practicality of having the uh, peace building approach implemented on the ground. What do you think, how we can promote peace without war? So this is my question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ferris. And then finally, Luis. Hello, everyone. My name is Luis um, from Venezuela. Uh, everybody says that in this moment that we as young are change maker. Um, I don't think that our age uh, is the only thing that uh, define what we can do and ex define that we are the change maker, you know. What honor, uh, another kind of resources and different to money, um, we need to be a real change makers. And I'm talking also about uh, soft and hard skills. Thank you. Thank you. So we <laughs> have just over five more minutes. So I'm going to ask Victor, Steve, and then give the last words to our youth leaders and then uh, Dahlia and Rawan, in that order, to briefly reflect on the comments that have been made. And I understand we don't have pieces of paper in front of us, so just share whatever reflections you can yeah. within just a, a few minutes, please. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the wonderful questions. And my brother from Afghanistan, Nigeria, and South Sudan, I think, to begin with, we have to commit ourselves to promote peace during peace, and we will promote peace during war. The world as it is, they talk about peace only when there is war. And if the country is at peace, nobody will think about how can we have a peace building program or something like that. But 
as young people, it ties to the economic benefit. War is so profitable. There are so many war profiters. Your suffering is a big business to some people. So we got to be able to tell the world that whether you like it or not, we are coming forward, we are stepping forward with so much love and trust and respect to tell you that war has become so profitable that talking about peace makes you an enemy. I also want to say, when you are promoting peace, know that you don't, don't underestimate that you don't have enemies. You, even if you're a peace builder, you have enemies. You're a warrior, you have enemies. So you, have to, you get to know that the, the worst enemy is the one who hates you, not because you're doing something that makes you know, uh, something bad, but the worst enemy is the one that hates you because you're doing something good that makes them look bad. And in this case, you're promoting peace in the face of war that is so profitable. You've got to be very careful to know that. How I became who I am today after 15 years, my brother from Afghanistan asked, I think it's good to share personal stories like this so that you can compare notes. I said I was born in war in northern Uganda. Life was all about conflict. I didn't know anything. I grew up, I spent 20 years of my childhood in the camp. My education, I paid myself in school. I burned charcoal, I cut trees like everywhere. Sometimes the very charcoal I cut, I come and find the rebel planted landmines around it. And you ask, what did I do? I'm just cutting trees to get $20 to pay myself in school. Some of you might be lucky that you, despite the hardship, you still secured opportunity to study. But some of us had to work that way. If I'm to look at when did I start working, I was 13 years old when I decided to form a peace club in the camp. A very naughty 13 years old guy who chose to chose peace in the face of child soldiers recruitment. And primarily my move was to mobilize myself and my friends to decampaign child soldiers recruitment that was being done by the armed forces. And I became the common enemy for both child soldiers recruiters from the armed government side and also from the, from the rebel side. And then along the way, 15 years ago, on the peak of war, on the peak of suffering, you could see that everybody had given up hope. There was no hope at all. When I formed this initiative to just help us come together as those who have been through, you know, <coughs> through war, reintegration of former child soldiers, and then without money. I remember moving from one UN door to another UN door asking for $500. Nobody gave me anything. There were so many international organizations all driving the heavy humanitarian, fleets of heavy humanitarian cars, VX land cruisers and all that, asking, nobody gave us money. But we chose to stick on the side of peace. We started working to support the victim, mobilize money, and that has been able to help us move on to where we are today. I could say we are now somehow funded, but we continue to do more. So it's going to be difficult, Victor, but you have to you. carry on. Thank you. So thank we're you. just about out of time, so I'm going to ask just in 30 <coughs> seconds or less, if you can just give advice to our, our right. peace just, building leaders. Just really quickly, uh, eight of the 11 largest uh, arms exporters are Western democracies. But without armies, ISIS and Boko Haram would have never been defeated. So the answer around an arms trade is very, very complex. We come back and we look at the, what creates for peaceful societies. Uh, there's a, God, one has to look at a society as a system. Mm. And so many, many different things need to come together to create peace. But one of the things which does come with peace is economic prosperity. And so by getting a message and tying economic prosperity in to the people who are, who are the leaders of your society, if you can get that across, it's a message which resonates one well, it's one we sell. But there's a whole range of things like low levels of corruption, a equitable distribution of resources, acceptance of the rights of others, and strong business environment. But, in final, saying, what did it say? Unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, cooperation, or inclusiveness necessary to solve the problems facing the world. Thank you, Steve. Mm. So, Dahlia and Rowan, please take us home, and we just have a, f a, a, a few minutes left. Well, I am totally agree with Edris. At the end, we need, the, we need money to do better things. But my reality as Venezuelan is really different, especially talking about receive money for another country. So for me, it's a risky thing. But I will give you an advice. When you want to get the attention of the sponsor, you must say that you 
as young leaders are representing one of the major groups that the 21 Agenda recognizes as one of the main groups that have to participate and being included in all the different strategies of United Nations. That includes the 2030 Agenda. That will be a good idea to get their attention, especially if you are trying to get the attention of an international agency. And another example, uh, this is an opportunity. The USIP bring us here to Dharamsala. So we have to keep this in mind to remember that it's not all about the money, it's about the opportunities too. Thank you. Rowan. Well, um, I mean, in conclusion, uh, because I heard the word media, Steve talked a lot about how we should use media to promote uh, peace and also like how a question came up how to promote peace even during conflict and during peace. But I think like, so I go back to, to one thing I said, it's like knowing your target group. And youth is a majority. We, we are a majority in most of the areas we live in. And stereotyping youth here for a little bit, but youth use media a lot. So basically media is, is in our hands. We know how to use it. Uh, it's basically uh, how to use it correctly to advocate for the right things. Um, and one thing uh, we did, it's like, uh, we try, we still, we try, we always try to go out of the box when it comes to our media platforms. And so one of the awareness uh, programs that we're doing on gender-based violence, uh, we illustrated a gender-based violence Libyan women are subjected to into comic stories. And that gained more attention. And more people are reading them. Rather than just, for instance, writing stiff lines uh, or long sentences that no one that will grab no one's attention so i think it's also about how to mobilize uh, and uh, take advantage of the tools that you have so i think pop culture it's it's something that uh, we can really like uh, structure it together and like um, and advocate for our causes through it because basically everything happens through pop culture in my opinion uh, whether we're speaking about movies art comics music everything is advocated through that and we have the capacity and the ability uh, to advocate peace through that as well. So I think as, as, as youth leaders and, and as uh, 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 youth organizations, we, I think we can really pull this off when it comes to the media coverage and, and it will also uh, be a good, uh, good way to uh, advocate for your messages. And also like when, when targeting the international community and targeting the UN entities and targeting uh, the national government. I think it's, it's really just about taking different approaches based on, on your targeted group, but doing them all as an, as an collective, uh, as an collective attack. It it's doesn't happen on a separate terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rowan, and thank you, all our panelists. Our time has come to a close. I just, in closing, want to share these thoughts. Our youth leaders came to Dharamsala to be inspired by each other, each other's work, and of course, by His Holiness. We've spent a good six, seven hours over two days with His Holiness this week, and they have indeed been inspired by Him. I saw it within my own eyes. But I also saw in His Holiness's eyes how He has been inspired by our youth leaders, by their courage, by their work, by their sacrifice, by their hope, by their optimism, by their knowledge. And in His eyes, I saw in all of the eyes of the elders in the room, that SDG 16, all of the Sustainable Development Goals, will be achieved by 2030 because of our youth, of our youth leaders, and all of your colleagues around the world who are doing incredible peace building work. So on that note, I thank all of our panelists. I thank our youth leaders and my colleagues from USIP and Radio Free Asia. And I bid you uh, greetings from beautiful Dharamsala. Thank you for joining us.